Okay, we will now continue our observational overview of active galactic nuclei. Uh, and today we are going to talk about jets and radio loud active galactic nuclei. So first we will start with some overall context as usual. We will go to our powers of 10 diagrams that we have shown many times before. And so thus far in previous lectures, we have talked about the black hole region. We have talked about the broad line region. We've talked about uh, the narrow line region and outflowing winds. We've just in the last lecture talked about the obscuring Taurus. And um, we've talked about, in fact, emission extending all the way out through to the, through to the extended narrow line region on the scale of the galaxy. Um, today, <clears throat> we again are going to talk about jets and related phenomena. And this is a truly multi-scale phenomenon. We now directly observe jets to be launched in the immediate vicinity of supermassive black holes, and then they extend over many orders of magnitude and scale to, again, a factor of 10 times larger here, another factor of 10 times larger here, and then continue outward here and out past the galaxy, where we observe jets ultimately terminating with shocks pr uh, producing uh, hot spots and, and lobes out on megaparsec scale. So we observe jets uh, exhibiting all sorts of fascinating behavior from the immediate vicinity of the supermassive black hole all the way out to megaparsec scale. So this is a phenomenon that spans almost all of the powers of 10, essentially all the powers of 10 that I've talked about in this entire course jets can be there. Now, they're not always there. Um, at least strong ones aren't always there. But when they are there in a strong manner, they can extend over an enormous range of scales. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's uh, remind ourselves just uh, of a little bit of history then. I presented this uh, brief historical overview of uh, active galactic nucleus studies, I believe in the first lecture. I'm just highlighting here uh, one of the important discoveries I, I had mentioned, and, and that is a, a man named Heber Curtis, noted back in 1918 in the galaxy M87, which is a very massive galaxy that sits down in the center of the Virgo cluster. He noted a so-called curious straight ray connected with the nucleus by a thin line of matter. Here is Heber Curtis. Here's an image of Heber Curtis. Here, in fact, is uh, the publication where that text comes from. And in fact, it, it's written right here. A curious straight ray lies in a gap in the nebulosity at a position angle of 20 degrees, apparently connected with the nucleus by a thin line of matter. Now, Heber Curtis um, didn't understand what he was seeing at the time, but he was seeing a jet. Uh, the jet in M87, which has been studied extensively uh, today. In fact, the 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 uh, jet of M87 can be seen even by you know uh, skilled amateur astronomers. Here, for example, is uh, a uh, image of M87 taken with a 22 inch uh, telescope, and after image processing, you can bring out the jet quite nicely. Okay, we'll see much better images of that jet a little bit later, but 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 there it is. Um, seen by an amateur astronomer. Okay, um, <clears throat> so an another point which I just want to then mention, Heber Curtis you know, noticed this in uh, 1918, but you have to kind of understand the historical context by looking at these other events. You have to remember back in 1918, we still didn't really have a proper understanding that galaxies in general were extragalactic objects and that we live in a galaxy and there's many other such galaxies out there in the universe. That really wasn't appreciated until Edwin Hubble's work around 1924 to 1929. And also, well, in 1918, well, general relativity had just been, uh, you know, finally developed in its final form in, you know, in 1915, three years earlier, uh, the Schwarzschild solution was found a year later, but people didn't build up a proper understanding of black holes for, for many decades afterward. Okay, so poor Heber Curtis here, noticing a relativistic jet sitting out, sticking out of M87, had no ability to really interpret what he was seeing in any proper way. He didn't understand the nature of galaxies because people didn't understand this. Uh, general relativity had not been built up enough to explain 
uh, you know, to, to give us a foundation for understanding black holes at the time. And so it was a remarkable observation that had to wait a long time to be properly interpreted. Okay, um, so as usual, um, the study of AGN jets is an enormous subject. Uh, there are There is a huge amount of ongoing research on AGN jets. And as evidence of that, here I show you the posters from three uh, recent conferences. Uh, here's one, extragalactic jets at all scales, talking about the launching, propagation, and termination of these jets uh, held in Germany. Here was uh, a, a, a meeting on the VLA Sky Survey, which is a radio survey detecting large numbers of these relativistic jets held in 2022. There was much uh, discussion of um, jets at this meeting, which I attended. And here is, in fact, a the 10th the in a series of meetings held uh, for astronomers in the mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. on radio loud active galactic nuclei. So here, every year, there is a, a small regional meeting discussing uh, radio loud AGNs and jets and so on. And then there are entire books on uh, jets as well. Here is a nice uh, book that I would recommend to you if you'd like to learn more. Uh, titled Relativistic Jets from Active Galactic Nuclei, which has you know much further discussion of these jets. And as usual, today I will uh, only be showing a few selected highlights, of course, from this vast body of exciting, high-quality, ongoing work. Okay, so let's get started <coughs> with uh, a discussion of the radio emission associated with uh, radio-loud active galactic nuclei and their jets. So, a significant minority of active galactic nuclei launch powerful jets of relativistic particles and magnetic fields. Uh, the fraction of AGNs that do this, well, if you look at optically luminous AGNs, uh, this fraction is about 10% as a ballpark number. Um, these AGNs are termed as being radio loud. Now, I will provide a more precise definition of exactly how you define a radio loud AGN later, but for now, you just take it on faith. Um, and the reason these things are radio loud is because the jets produce strong radio emission. Okay, the relativistic particles and magnetic fields in the jet interact. The relativistic particles spiral around the magnetic fields and produce synchrotron radiation. And that's the main source of emission uh, from these jets. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about one extremely well-studied example of a radio-loud AGN. I'm going to go back to our little history now, going to the next slide along. So now we're in 1939. And in 1939, a man named Grote Reber, who remarkably was an amateur uh, radio astronomer, uh, who built a radio telescope in his backyard, discovered a radio source now named Cygnus A, the A indicating that it is the brightest radio source in the constellation of Cygnus. Uh, this source then, after about 15 years, things proceeded a little more slowly back then in astronomy, but after about 15 years, eventually astronomers were able to find the counterpart to Cygnus A optically and measure its redshift. It's, it's at a redshift of 0.057. Okay, so that's some basic information about Cygnus A. We've known about Cygnus A, as you can see here, for a very long time indeed. Um, here is a beautiful image of Cygnus A <clears throat> taken at 6 centimeters or 5 gigahertz. Um, and to give you a sense of the scale, this large-scale radio-emitting structure uh, in total spans about 120 kiloparsecs in, in linear extent. So, so what's going on in this system? Well, first I have to give you a few definitions. Usually in these systems, you see a bright central object in the radio, and that's referred to as the radio core. That usually that lines up with the center of the galaxy uh, that is the source, ultimately, you know, of the large-scale structure, which extends well beyond the galaxy, of course, on those kinds of scales. Um, so... That's essentially where the supermassive black hole is. And then you see these linear features referred to as jets extending outward from the core. And these propagate outward to a large distance uh, and then, and, well, in this case, terminate in hot spots, these bright hot spots here 
and here, and then ultimately produce these large scale lobes. Okay. Cygnus A, by the way, is a remarkable stroke of sort of good luck for humanity. Uh, that can be appreciated by looking at this little inset plot here where Cygnus A is shown here. And th this plot basically shows for a set, I believe, of uh, 3C radio galaxies. It shows the, the radio luminosity of these systems versus redshift. And you can see Cygnus A is a wild outlier in terms of being at quite low redshift, but being extremely luminous. So just by good fortune, nature has helped out humanity in, in this respect by putting a giant radio galaxy relatively nearby uh, in the universe. Well, excuse me, an extremely powerful radio galaxy um, nearby uh, in the universe. Okay, um, <clears throat> now what's going on here? Well, when people first discovered these systems, there was a lot of sort of mystery as to how these lobes had been made. They're enormous after all. Um, originally, some people thought, in fact, that there was some sort of giant cosmic explosion that had happened that had produced the lobes. Um, but it was quickly uh, appreciated that, that that type of a model wouldn't work and that a, this is a, a sort of continuous process uh, that is playing out to produce the lobes. Uh, specifically, uh, the jets, which you can see here and here, are continually beaming up energy from the core. So the core is ultimately the powerhouse of this system. And something down in the core is uh, allowing energy to be beamed out in these jets these jets then fly out relativistically to very large scales, okay, where they interact with material to produce the lobes. That's the idea. And you can even see here in sort of the swirly pattern, some backflow of material where after the jet flies out and terminates in these hot spots, some of the material flows back. So, so that's the basic idea. Now, uh, again, there's been much modeling of these systems. Here is a nice, simple diagram that gives you the essentials. Um, the first point to appreciate is that Cygnus A has been growing, likely, for tens of millions of years or more. So this thing is a very old structure, and it has evolved substantially over the likely tens of millions of years that it has been around. Um, Cygnus A almost surely, well, well, surely was not this large when it first got started. Uh, something and we'll talk more about what the possibilities for this are later on, energize the core to start producing jets, okay? These jets, when Cygnus A first started, were much smaller, okay? And the jets might have only propagated out to a rather small uh, distance, out to here and here, before, that struck, before they struck a significant amount of, um, well, interstellar or intergalactic material and, and then terminated. And the lobes then would have been here and here. But eventually, under the continual action of these jets, the material that was there, the intergalactic medium that was there, was cleared out of the way, or shocked and cleared out of the way. And so um, then the jets were able to propagate further out. Okay, then the jets propagated further out, and the lobes were here. And then after more time, the lobes were here and here. And today, it so happens that the lobes of Cygnus A are here and here, or there and there. So again, this Cygnus A is kind of like a process. It's still unfolding. And if we come back and look at Cygnus A in you know, a few um, additional tens of millions of years, it will surely have expanded even more. So this thing is provided it keeps going, it will continue to grow over time. So this is a, a, a process uh, that is still unfolding. This system is growing and growing over time again as uh, material in the intergalactic medium is shocked and cleared out of the way and thereby allows the jets to propagate out to even larger distances before they're disturbed. Okay, this is where they happen to be disturbed right now. This is where the jets are flying out, striking the intergalactic medium and getting terminated. Okay, um, so again, you can see that the basic prediction then is you have a large scale bow shock out here at the end. Okay, just past where the lobes are, you have in this interior region shocked jet material, and then you have shot, shocked intergalactic medium kind of surrounding that. Okay, so that's the overall schematic for illustrating what we think is going on here in a basic way. Um, <clears throat> a number of other important uh, observations. Here are images of the lobes of Cygnus A. So this one here is, is, is this lobe, and this one over here is, is that one, okay? Uh, and these are images, in this case, at 6 gigahertz 
uh, that are capable of measuring the level of polarization at 6 gigahertz in the radio. And these color bars show the degree of polarization, fractional degree of polarization, and it is large, okay? You can see that the degree of fractional polarization uh, gets up to be, well, you can see tens of percent. So this is very highly polarized uh, emission. Now, exactly how you measure this degree of polarization is a complex thing. It depends somewhat upon the scale at which you measure the polarization because things can tend to average out, but, but it's unquestionable that the level of polarization is indeed very high, tens of percent. Okay, and moreover, of course, you can measure the, the you know, polarization vector, and people then have made plots of, in this case, the intrinsic magnetic field orientations at 0.3 arc second resolution across the lobes okay, of uh, Cygnus A. So here's mapping of how the magnetic fields are moving or, or, or aligned uh, throughout the lobes, okay, of Cygnus A here and there. Okay, so this polarization is extremely important for, for a couple key reasons. First of all, uh, it indicates strongly that the emission mechanism in the radio is indeed primarily synchrotron. That's one very important finding. So now we know the emission mechanism, the polarization is strongly telling us it almost surely is synchrotron. Okay, and then of course from our physical understanding of synchrotron emission, we can then calculate the amount of energy in these lobes. Again, the, these lobes then, the idea is the emission that we're seeing is coming from synchrotron, from charged particles spiraling around magnetic fields, okay, relativistic particles spiraling around magnetic fields, and we can calculate from our physical understanding of synchrotron how much power is in these lobes, and it's enormous. It's like 10 to the 59 ergs or more, okay. Um, in the lobes of Cygnus A, <coughs> and, and that energy, of course, is locked up in the energetic particles and in the magnetic fields. So that's a huge amount of energy. 10 to the 59 ergs is an enormous amount of energy. Remember, the, the energy from a core collapse supernova is only about 10 to the 53 ergs. So here we're talking about something that is orders of magnitude more than a supernova, like a million supernova. And of course, a supernova releases most of its energy as neutrinos, only about 1%, about 10 to the 51 orgs actually comes out as sort of radiative or um, kinetic energy. And so this is a truly enormous number, okay, 10 to the 59 orgs in energetic particles and magnetic fields as compared to sort of 10 to the 51 orgs leaving aside the neutrinos uh, for a supernova. So this, this, is a, this is an enormously, ener these are enormously energetic structures. And one has to wonder then, well, where is the battery? Where is the source of energy that allows them to be made? And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Another important point is that the appearance of these large uh, radio structures um, substantially depends upon the frequency at which they are being observed. And that can be appreciated by looking at these two panels, which shows Cygnus A observed at 5 gigahertz. That's the image I've shown you previously. And then here in the bottom, Cygnus A being observed at 15 gigahertz. Okay, you can see that the appearance between these two panels is quite different for Cygnus A. In particular, as you go to the higher radio frequencies, much of the diffuse uh, emission associated with the lobes becomes less visible. Most of it becomes almost invisible to see. And um, if at high frequencies, then uh, what is more prominent, at least in a relative sense, is the core and these hot spots. Um, now, why is that? Well, that can be understood physically in terms of um, you know, synchrotron aging uh, of electrons. In particular, at these high frequencies, uh, where of course you're sampling more energetic electrons, um, well, those electrons have relatively short cooling time. So you're seeing them in regions where new electrons are freshly being energized uh, at, at, you know, at, at those uh, ener higher energies corresponding to that frequency. Uh, that is in the core, you know, and in the hot spots there. Okay, but the point just empirically, again, is that um, the relative importance of, the, for example, the lobes, versus the core is substantially a function of frequency, where again, the lobes tend to be much more prominent at low frequencies, and the core and hot spots as well tend to be uh, more prominent fractionally, again, uh, at the higher frequencies. So now what I'd like to do is to show you some beautiful images, um, giving you just examples of the morphologies we observe from these uh, radio uh, AGNs. 
This is another very famous example. This is uh, NGC 1265, which is an active galaxy producing relativistic jets that lives in the Perseus cluster. Now, the Perseus cluster, as is generally the case for, for massive clusters, is filled with a bunch of hot intracluster gas. This gas is seen by its emission in the X-ray band. And uh, what is happening in, in this particular system is as this radio uh, jet producing AGN flies through the Perseus cluster, well, the, the hot intracluster medium pushes against it, almost like when you go out running, you feel a wind in your face. And um, in this case, that, that wind is sweeping the radio jets backward producing a kind of beautiful cosmic sky writing where you can see that NGC uh, 1265 has moved along on a trajectory like this, okay, as, well, starting here and, of course, moving along this way as it has gone through the, the Perseus cluster. So that's one example of a remarkable uh, morphology that these systems can have. When they're in a cluster, you can get all sorts of fascinating interactions between the hot intracluster gas and the, the radio plasma in, in the jets. Um, here are a few more just nice examples. And as we will see, there's many more where, where these came from, you know, of all the different types of uh, morphology. You'll notice that sometimes the lobes are fractionally more prominent. Sometimes the central region is more prominent. We'll talk about that uh, more uh, shortly. And then sometimes you have structures like this one here, which has a strange X-shaped morphology. And one wonders, well, what is it that led to that X-shaped morphology? Well, that's, that still is a very interesting question that's being actively researched. Um, here are some more examples, just to show you there's lots more where, where those came from. These now are uh, radio galaxy images down at 74 uh, megahertz from the so-called VLA Low Frequency Sky Survey. And you can see all sorts of fascinating morphologies uh, for the radio sources there. And of course, at those low frequencies, you tend to see a lot of this um, extended um, sort of lobe and, and associated emission uh, in, in these systems. Um, here are some additional uh, nice examples. These are radio galaxy images at two to four gigahertz from the VLA Sky Survey, which is an ongoing survey being conducted with, with the VLA doing all sorts of great science. And, and look at all of the... Um, you know, beautiful uh, radio galaxy uh, sources being seen there. And then, you know, again, we have now in enormously large samples of these things, millions of them. And so people have even been able to go and uh, assemble uh, fairly large samples of um, remarkable objects. In this case, I believe this is 100, yeah, it's 10 by 10. So this is 100 uh, examples uh, derived via careful checking of a large sample of ob objects by, by this astronomer uh, of so-called winged and X-shaped uh, radio galaxies. So you see many of these have those strange X-shaped morphologies like the one that I had highlighted uh, back here uh, in the lower uh, left. And um, you can see there's many more where those came from here. So we, there's all sorts of you know, fascinating morphologies the, these radio sources could have. And, and then I also uh, want to highlight then the so-called giant radio galaxies. So remember, I told you Cygnus A is a powerful radio galaxy. Um, it's about 120 kiloparsecs in extent or 0.12 megaparsecs in extent. But we know of systems out there in the distant universe that make Cygnus A look tiny. Um, here, for example, this is Hercules A. You can see that's considerably larger than Cygnus A, and these are all shown to scale. So that's Cygnus A there. That's Hercules A, considerably larger, but you can get much larger still. Here is a 3C236. It has a linear extent of like 4.59 megaparsecs. Here is J1420. It has a linear extent of like 4.87 megaparsecs. Here's one that's 4.98 megaparsecs. Um, and so... <clears throat> there are truly enormous so-called giant radio galaxies out in the universe that, again, make uh, Cygnus A look tiny, even though Cygnus A, of course, is, is very impressive in its own right. Um, and here is another nice example of, of one uh, studied extensively by one of my colleagues at, at Penn State, uh, an example of a radio galaxy. In this case, it has an extent of about three megaparsecs. Again, impressively large. Um, Another point I want to make about the radio emission before we move on and start talking about uh, morphological classification 
is that uh, the I want to say a few words just about radial variability. Well, well, first of all, obviously the extended radial lobes, given their given their enormous extent, do not vary on human time scales. Now, on time scales of many millions of years, they surely do vary, as I talked about, because these sources are in the process of growing over time. Um, but on human time scales. Uh, they don't vary to, to any significant degree, you know, the extended radial lobes and so on. However, uh, the radio core emission is very different. It often varies and sometimes quite strongly. Here is just uh, one example showing the long-term radio variability of 3C273, a, a very well-known uh, radio loud active galactic nucleus, and you can see at 8 gigahertz, 15 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and 3.3 millimeters, you know, significant variability over time. And this, this is a fairly long time scale uh, light curve running from 1965 up until, I don't know, around 2000 or so. And you can see it varies in, um, you know, interesting ways. And, and moreover, you know, there is correlated variability across different frequencies. This 37 gigahertz flare here is also seen at 15 gigahertz and also here in a more dampened way at 8 gigahertz. Okay, so radio core emission often varies and sometimes quite strongly. And, and furthermore, there is a subset of radio loud active galactic nuclei, the ones that tend to have quite high uh, polarization of, of the core uh, that are extremely variable often across the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the, the so-called blazars, for example, that I will talk about uh, later on. Okay, now I want to say a few words about the morphological classification of these radio loud active galactic nuclei according to their radio emission. So, um, there are a number of ways that these radio sources are classified morphologically. I'm just going to give you the essentials. First of all, the, the sort of first discrimination that, that people tend to make is whether a radio source is lobe dominated or core dominated. And, and here are um, two um, you know, examples of a lobe dominated source, again, Cygnus A, and a core dominated source, 3C273. So, over here for the lobe, lobe dominated source. Well, the point is that the lobes here, especially at the lower frequencies, but, he, but also true at 15 gigahertz, if you include the hot spots here, produce most of the power, observed power uh, from this system. Okay, the lobes integrated up are brighter than the core. Okay, um, that's a lobe dominated source. The lobes are dominating the power seen from the system. Okay. Um, Alternatively, you can have core-dominated sources. This is 3C273, again, observed here at 15 gigahertz. There is an extended radio jet there, um, but most of the power from this system is coming from the core. Uh, it may be not easy to see that from, from this diagram, but again, these are contour levels being shown here. And all of these, this densely packed ring you're seeing there are the contour levels going up and up and up and up and up and up and up, uh, indicating the very bright flux of the core, which outweighs the flux uh, from you know the, the extended jet uh, seen in this system. Now, again, the lobe versus core dominance will can vary with frequency because I've taught, as you can see here again, the morphology of, of these sources changes significantly with the frequency at which you observe it. So you have to be a little careful and always be consistent when you sort of are saying, well, the source is lobe dominated versus core dominated. You have to say what frequency you mean and, and so on. Um, but um, yeah, and, and as I had already mentioned, you know, the core generally becomes more fractionally dominant at high radio frequencies above a few gigahertz. Uh, there are also, uh, of course, uh, distance and resolution effects, you know, to be considered here. Clearly, if you have a source at a very great distance, um, some of what would truly be extended emission if the source were, were closer by may appear to be part of the core emission because you simply can't resolve it. And similarly, if you observe with a very low resolution instrument, well then again, you may mix some of the, 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 the extended emission with the core and artificially attribute it to the core. So it's a bit tricky uh, you know exactly how you define lobe dominated versus core dominated but the basic separation turns out to be practically useful and you will often hear people referring to lobe dominated versus core dominated sources and this is what is meant by the morphology okay um now this 
sort of um, morphological classification also links with, for example, radio spectral shape. Um, <clears throat> specifically, um, these radio sources often, at least a first uh, order, uh, show power law radio spectra, such as the flux is proportional to the frequency to some power often called alpha. That's the power. Um, so the lobe dominated sources, they usually show so-called steep radio spectra with alpha between about 0.5 and 1. And you, you can appreciate that again here in the sense that, well, for steep spectrum objects, as you go to low frequencies, the lobes become much more fractionally prominent. So that that, that radio slope is referring to this phenomenon comparing 15 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Okay? Um, whereas then, in contrast, the core dominated sources, they usually show flat spectra with alpha less than about 0.5 or so. So, so um, excuse me, uh, back here, uh, these sources here, the core dominated sources tend to have the, the flat uh, radio spectra. Now, that being said, a power law model, especially for the core dominated sources, usually isn't a perfect fit. There could be significant deviations from a power law. But again, the basic distinction is practically useful. It holds pretty well. Now, um, much of this radio morphological and now spectral division, you know, is thought to be due to the orientation of the jet to our line of sight, such that core dominated sources, which have the flat radio spectrum, well, they tend to be the sources that have the jet more pointed toward us. Uh, whereas the lobe dominated sources, you know, in contrast, tend to have the jets pointed away, away from us and, and the system more lies in the plane of the sky, as for uh, Cygnus A. Now that distinction there doesn't always hold, but it's a pretty good first order uh, uh, point uh, to keep in mind. Okay, a few more points then on radiomorphological classification. Um, another um, very important uh, morphological classifier uh, goes back to a famous paper by Fanaroff and Riley back in 1974, and, and they had uh, gathered images of a set of these extended radio sources and noticed some, some fascinating aspects uh, to them. Uh, first of all, they noted that many of the sources in their sample of objects with these radio images were so-called center brighten sources, where the central parts of the source not just the core, but the central parts of the extended jets uh, as well, um, often dominated the radio flux. And as you move further away, um, the jets faded, okay? Furthermore, they noted these systems were often bent. Uh, you can see the bending of the jet in this particular system. Often these systems were bent. Um, in contrast, then, a source like Cygnus A uh, is different. It is an edge brightened source. So in other words, in this source, you can see most of the power comes from out here at the edges of the extent of the radio structure. This is an edge brightened source, rather different than what's going on here. And these sources tend to have usually fairly straight um, jet morphology, at least out until where the jet terminates out of the hot spots and so on. Okay, now then, um, the, the classification goes that the systems that are like this, the centered Brighton ones that are often bent, are referred to as the fanaroff riley type 1 radio galaxies. And the ones that have the um, edge brightened uh, morphologies are the fanaroff riley 2 uh, radio galaxies. Now, what's going on to, to, to cause this? Well, um, as we'll see, um, we think this is linked significantly to this overall dynamics of the jet. We think that these FR1 jets start off initially relativistic, moving relativistically on small scales, but then once they get out to sort of kiloparsec scales, they decelerate. Uh, so there's deceleration of the jet material going on out there. In contrast, the FR2 jets remain relativistic throughout. So they, they start off relativistic here and they maintain uh, relativistic speeds out to large scales. Um, <clears throat> now then, why is there this distinction? Why are these are there these types? Well, this is likely due to the interplay between the intrinsic jet power of the system. Some of these systems may make jets that are just more powerful than others. And it also likely has an interplay with the density of the environment around the radio source. Such that, for example, a jet of a given power is generally going to be better able to remain relativistic 
out to large scales in poorer environments. So again, the thinking for Cygnus A is that it has cleared out its small scale environment via the previous action of the jet. And that's a big reason why the jet can propagate out to large distances, um, you know, without being, um, you know, terminated uh, and, and losing its, you know, focused uh, or collimated nature. Okay. Um, so, so that's the basic aspect of the morphological classification. But Fanaroff and Riley noted something else remarkable as well. They noted that the FR2 radio galaxies tended to be substantially more radioluminous in general than the FR1 uh, radio galaxies. And this plot here shows you know, a later version of essentially what they noted. So the, the FR1 versus FR2 division, which again is a morphological division, also appears to be linked to the radio the radio luminosity, at least for sources drawn from fairly shallow radio surveys. Um, and, and this plot then shows the log of the absolute uh, 1400 um, megahertz radio luminosity versus in this case the I believe it's the R band yeah the R band optical luminosity of the host galaxy. And notably, you can see that all of the sources labeled two here, the Fanaroff Riley two sources tend to be more um, radioluminous than the FR1 sources. Now, the distinction isn't absolutely perfect, but it's pretty darn good. Okay, and, and people thought, wow, that, that's quite remarkable. Uh, there, there's this, this remarkable distinction. This must have some important physical meaning to it. And there has been much discussion of exactly what that meaning might be. Um, I may say some more about that later on. Um, one one point I will make: the reason why in, in this plot that that the of uh, the the um, R band luminosity, optical luminosity, of the host galaxy is shown is people thought this again could be an indicator of envir environment such that again more luminous galaxies over here, um, you know, would would um, indicate perhaps richer environments and uh, ones over here would indicate poorer environments. But anyway, there's a remarkable linkage there, at least for sources drawn from fairly shallow radio surveys. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, the sort of cleanliness of this distinction between the type 1s and the type 2s in radio luminosity uh, becomes less clear as you go, as you perform deeper radio surveys reaching fainter flux limits uh, for samples drawn from deeper radio surveys that are now available. This morphology luminosity connection, while still there, it is less clear cut uh, as appears here. And I refer you to section 3.1 of, of this particular paper if you'd like to read some more details about that and, and see some additional references. Okay, so those are some points about radio morphological classification. Again, you have this lobe dominated versus core dominated business, um, which links to spectral properties. And, and then you also have this um, morphological classification of center brightened versus edge brightened. And that seems to link with radio luminosity, which is quite interesting. I also just want to say a few words about um, radio quiet objects as well. So um, as we will see, um, most active galaxies are radio quiet, do not produce these powerful relativistic jets. Nevertheless, some radio quiet active galactic nuclei at least do show small jets. Um, here is, is one uh, famous example. This is NGC 4151, a nearby Seyfert active galaxy. has a nice linear structure to it, indicative of a jet. Okay, down here is a, is a sample of um, radio quiet quasars. And <clears throat> what you're seeing in, in these cases, well, the contours are showing the radio morphology. And then these... Um, axes, the, the dashed lines, are showing the system axis, I believe as determined using uh, ionization cones and so on. And you can see, you often see linear radio structures, even in radio quiet quasars. Um, and that morphology, that linear morphology, normally lines up pretty well with the direction of the system as determined by ionization cones and so on. So that is, um, you know, interesting and remarkable. Radio quiet active galactic nuclei are not radio silent. They do have jets as well, but the jets are much scaled down, both in terms of their overall size, they're much smaller in size, and in terms of the total radio power being produced, hence why the systems are known as radio quiet. Now, the whole business of the nature of the radio emission in radio quiet active galactic nuclei is a 
complex subject that is still debated. In fact, I attended a conference uh, several years back in, in Italy where this uh, topic was extensively debated. Um, people, some people believe, and, the, and probably all of these have elements of truth to them, some people believe that jets are perhaps the most important factor in uh, producing the radio emission of radio quiet active galactic nuclei. Some people believe the corona may actually produce a significant amount of the radio emission. Some people believe that outflowing winds, like, like I talked about in the lecture on winds, may produce much of the radio emission. And then, of course, star formation in the host galaxy almost surely produces a significant radio emission as well. And you can read this review paper on the sources of the radio emission from radio quiet AGNs if you'd like to learn more about that. Okay. Um, now, also, um, it is of interest just to look at a sort of characteristic diagrams when assessing sort of morphological classification. This is a nice long used diagram among radio astronomers that shows the radio power versus the size for different active galactic nuclei classes. Okay, and you can see, well, the FR1 systems are over here, the FR2 systems are over here. And again, as I had mentioned, as expected, the FR1 systems generally have lower radio luminosities than do the FR2s, although as you can see here, the distinction is not as clear cut as from these, this early shallow radio survey, uh, for example. Okay, um, and then if you go down to, or, you know, I guess, two orders of magnitude or even three orders of magnitude, smaller physical size scales, um, you have the safer galaxies, the radio quiet safer galaxies and liners, and the radio quiet quasars. These are much physically smaller systems, but do still have radio emission that sometimes uh, appears to be jet like. And then there are some other interesting radio classes here, which just due to the limited time I will not discuss in this lecture, but you can check out this uh, review paper if you'd like to learn more about them. In any case, this is a useful diagram, and it sort of puts the radio quiet systems the FR1 radio galaxies and the FR2 radio galaxies in context in terms of their powers and in terms of their sizes. Uh, now I would like to talk about the multi-wavelength emission of these radio loud active galactic nuclei. So far I've been very heavily focused on the radio emission, not surprisingly because that's how these systems were first noted and extensively studied, but these systems actually have fascinating and important multi-wavelength behavior as well, and indeed also multi-messenger behavior now. Um, here is another picture of Cygnus A, the, the system we've shown many times and has been using, have been using as our prototype. Uh, this one is a radio X-ray and optical composite image where the X-ray emission as sh is shown in with, with the bluish colors now, and then the radio emission is, is, is the reddish colors, and then the, the sort of yellow background uh, shows the shows the stars and galaxies in, in, in the image. Okay, um, this is a beautiful composite image. Uh, a couple of things I, I want to highlight here in terms of again the multi wavelength emission. First of all, um, note that the radio plasma out here in the lobes has excavated cavities in the X-ray emitting plasma. So again, Cygnus A lives in a cluster of galaxies. This is hot X-ray emitting gas intracluster medium. And the radio plasma has pushed against that X-ray emitting plasma and excavated out cavities over here and over here where the X-ray emission is less intense. And the radio plasma is filling those regions. Okay, so this is a nice example of so-called active galactic nucleus feedback. Uh, we've already talked about how active galactic nuclei can feedback upon their environment via their, their winds, but the jets of active galactic nuclei are another important source of such feedback and can affect uh, uh, um, structures on scales far larger than just a galaxy, but on size scales of, again, megaparsecs. Uh, entire clusters of galaxies are affected by this kind of feedback. Um, another point I want to highlight is if you look at the hotspots of um, Cygnus A uh, here and here and here, you can see they have some blue color associated with them as well. So the jets and the hotspots are also detected in the X-ray band. So um, this system, it, it, you see the hotspots there and the jets, it's a little harder to see here, but if you 
look at the x-ray image and process it carefully, you can see that the, the jets of Cygnus A are also detected uh, in the x-ray band. So the jets are multi-wavelength sources. I also now want to just sort of compare this image, uh, which is you know very beautiful with a lot of recent data with, again, this old modeling uh, effort from, again, 1989, which kind of looks like a sort of a squashed football or a a cigar or something like that. And you can see that they didn't do too badly predicting back in 1980 with 89 what the thing would be like. And there it is. Uh, again, much of this much of this emission you're seeing there is the, the shocked jet material and the shocked intergalactic medium. Okay. Um, now I want to talk about, SIG, about M87 from a multi-wavelength perspective. I've already... Um, showed you this nice amateur astronomer image uh, of M87 but of course you know with professional level uh, instrumentation people can do much better here is a beautiful optical image of M87 with the Hubble Space Telescope and the UBVI bands sort of combined together to make the colors and you can see the jet has this sort of clear linear structure extending down to very small scales down close to the nucleus of the galaxy and um, then extending outward to very large distances uh, and where it kind of then um, sort of tapers off out here and appears to bend a bit out at these large distances. So that's the optical jet. Um, now, <coughs> M87's jet, of course, is also very prominent in the radio. This is M87's jet in the radio from very large scales out here, zooming in to somewhat smaller scales and then somewhat smaller scales still and then smaller and smaller and smaller where they're tracking the jet down closer and closer to where the supermassive black hole is in M87. Um, so that's the radio emission and notably if you look at six centimeter radio emission so kind of between these two panels um, that's what this image is shown here and if you compare that to the x-ray image shown up here well you can see again the x-ray uh, emission aligns very clearly with the jet. So the jet is detected in the x-ray band out here as well. And then moreover again, you can see how the uh, radio emitting plasma uh, associated with the jet in the lobes has excavated cavities in part in the inner parts of the uh, Virgo cluster uh, for M87. There and there are those jet cavities. Okay, um, now then, here is a very nice uh, set of images showing the uh, uh, jet of M87 and its multi-wavelength emission in the radio here. Okay, that's the radio jet. Same thing you're seeing there and there shown here. Okay, this is the Hubble Space Telescope optical imaging of the jet. So that's its morphology on the same scale appropriately lined up uh, in the optical. Here it is in the X-ray. Again, with the Chandra X-ray Observatory, you can see the jet is detected in the X-ray band. And then this is an X-ray and optical overlay. So we have these wonderful now multi-wavelength measurements of the jet emission running all the way from the radio up to the X-ray band. Um, and <coughs> all these different measurements, um, you know, constrain the emission processes, the radiative processes of these extended jets. And... Detailed studies, not of only of M87, but of many systems, as we'll talk about, um, have shown that the radiative processes of extended jets at the different wavelengths are varied and, and quite fascinating. Again, you know, the, the radio is synchrotron to a large extent, but what exactly is going on to make the optical and the x-ray? Well, that's where things get much more complicated. And um, however, I will say that that an enormous amount of insight has been gained by looking at all of these multi-wavelength constraints upon the jets. For example, the multi-wavelength constraints indicate that, for example, jets have complex internal structures. They likely have a fast central spine and then a slower sheath surrounding the spine. So jets have interesting internal mor you know, morphology. Uh, that can be or, or structure that can be constrained with the multi-wavelength data and i'm not going to go through all the details of the 
radiative processes of extended jets at all the different wavelengths that could take an entire lecture on its own. But if you'd like to see some more detailed discussion of that type of a matter, I refer you to these nice uh, review articles where you can read uh, more about the various uh, radiative processes at the, the different wavelengths. Um, now, I want to show you another example. I want to show you 3C273. I've already talked a little bit about 3C273. Again, this was the sort of granddaddy of all the quasars, the first quasar discovered along with 3C48 um, in, in 1963, which has a redshift of 0.158. And I, I've already shown you a couple of images in the radio of uh, 3C273. Now I want to show you the multi-wavelength uh, behavior of, of this jet. So here is Hubble Space Telescope imaging of 3C273. And that is the jet coming out of 3C273 there. And here are images of the jet in the radio, in the optical, and in this case, the X-ray with optical overlay. And you can see there's a remarkable morphology uh, to the jet here. And again, the jet is well constrained at all the different wavelengths, again, giving us insights into the different emission processes operating in the extended jet. Um, here are a couple of other beautiful examples. Um, th th these are two other very famous, well-studied systems. This is Centaurus A, uh, as observed with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Look at the beautiful jet coming out there, for example, and then the lobe structures. Um, here is a Pictor A. I believe the blue color here yeah, is, is the X-ray, and then the red color is radio emission. So this is a nice radio X-ray composite. Look at that beautiful X-ray emitting jet extending out to large scales there. Those are two other nice examples, and there's many more where they have come from. Um, in fact, there is now a nice uh, publicly available um, catalog of extended X-ray jets that has about 120 X-ray jets listed in it, uh, and you can go to this website if you're interested and download nice uh, X-ray images of about 120 of these X-ray jet systems. Um, here are a couple of other just very nice examples of, of uh, jets, and in this case, uh, of, of their feedback. Um, this is the center of the Perseus cluster, another nearby cluster of galaxies, which again has hot intracluster gas uh, running throughout it. And in this case, you can see the, the Chandra image showing the hot X-ray emitting gas. And you can see there are cavities that have been excavated by the radio emitting plasma shown with the contour. So the jet is coming out in this direction, excavating the material out here, doing work against the, the hot intracluster medium. And uh, similarly, here's an even larger scale system uh, in the more distant universe, where again, uh, you can see the, the radio jet here and how it has excavated cavities in the uh, X-ray emission uh, shown as the, the blue color in, in this diagram. So this is a very large scale example of this kind of feedback. Okay, so jets are clearly multi-wavelength sources and um, all these multi-wavelength data have given us a lot of fundamental insights into the physical processes operating in these jets. Okay, um, finally, in, in this section, the final point I just want to make very briefly is that these jets are also now multi-messenger uh, sources. So beyond just photons, jets and lobes can also now generate cosmic rays and neutrinos. Uh, the cosmic rays are often generated by shocks, uh, large-scale shocks in these systems, which again, you have shocks in these systems that are bigger than galaxies. And... Um, uh, via Fermi acceleration, uh, energetic particles can be accelerated and uh, thus become energetic cosmic rays. Uh, furthermore, um, now, uh, in just in recent years, uh, people have started to detect evidence for neutrino emission associated with uh, these uh, radio loud active galactic nuclei. Here is a very uh, influential paper from the Ice Cube collaboration where they uh, suggest that they have detected a neutrino associated with a flaring blazar, a flaring radio loud active galactic nucleus. Uh, it, this is the name of the system, and you can see here these are the ice cube constraints on the location from where the, from whence the neutrino came, and then there are also additional multi messenger, multi wavelength observations of, of of this system. And here is the overall spectral energy distribution, and they put together a pretty convincing case 
although I think there probably is still a bit of debate, but a pretty convincing case that neutrinos have been detected from this system. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to go through all the multi-messenger aspects of these systems. This is a new, exciting um, development, you know, especially the neutrino aspects, um, uh, you know, of, of uh, radio loud active galactic nuclei. And if you'd like to learn more about that, here are a couple of reviews I refer you to uh, that, that are up to date, quite up to date and give you useful information. Okay. So that's a multi-messenger aspect. And um, now that we've talked about the radio emission from jets, the multi-wavelength and multi-messenger emission from jets, I wanna just uh, present a couple of general important findings about these jets. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about how we know these jets have relativistic motions I want to talk about how these jets are stable over in a huge range of scales, implying that there has to be a kind of gyroscope uh, in these systems that keeps the jets stable and pointed in the same direction for tens of millions of years. Um, I also want to talk about how jets are now known just directly from observations to form very close to the supermassive black hole. I'll talk about how jets might um, show precession of the gyroscope that I referred to. And then I will talk about how jets may have been present in our galaxy uh, long ago. So these are some important general findings that are worth knowing about. Um, first of all, uh, I want to talk about the evidence for relativistic motions uh, of these jets. We have many observations demonstrating beyond doubt that these jets are moving relativistically. Uh, a very basic argument which is nevertheless extremely persuasive, is called Doppler favoritism. Um, here is, is the idea. So here is M87 again. And notice that, for example, in this image here at the upper left, uh, the jet is certainly um, one-sided. Okay, The jet is bright on this side. You don't see a correspondingly bright jet on the other side. And that holds you know, on all these different scales as well. There just is no jet seen. However, there surely is a jet over on that other side, even though we're not directly seeing it, because you can see there is plasma that has been energized over on the other side. That's even more apparent on this large scale image here, where again, you can see this large scale plasma that has been uh, energized by the action of the jet. So there's a jet over there, we're just not seeing it. So, so why is that? Well, that's, that's where Doppler favoritism comes in. Particles, relativistic particles, of course, tend to beam their emission in their direction of motion. If you want to read in more details about the th this type of an effect, I refer you to this review article by Botcher, uh, 2012, which has a nice discussion of jet special relativistic effects. But essentially, this jet is more coming toward us than the jet on the other side. In fact, this jet on this side still isn't especially coming toward us. It still is inclined by about 17 degrees from our uh, line of sight, but nevertheless, the, the, the motions are sufficiently sufficiently fast that the beaming effect is, is substantial and the jet is much brighter on the approaching side than on the receding side. Again, due to the special relativistic effect of beaming uh, and, and thus that whole phenomenon is referred to as Doppler favoritism of jets. And that alone you know, tells you these jets are relativistic. There's much additional evidence as well. Uh, another piece of compelling evidence are the apparent superluminal motions uh, that, that are seen uh, in, in some jets. Uh, so people have been monitoring these jets for many years. Here's a case where uh, jets were monitored in 3C111 from 1995 to 2005, and people could track the motions of individual blobs moving along the jet over time, and they could work out how far these jets had appeared to move in a given amount of time. They could then work out the corresponding velocity. And they uh, deduced that the jets appear to be moving superluminally. In, in this system, they move at sort of appear to move at three to six times the speed of light. In, in this system down here in the bottom, M87, um, which has been extensively studied, um, th they appear to move, I believe, yeah, at 4.3 times the, the speed of light. And um, that apparent superluminal motion, well, of course, is, is not real superluminal motion. That's only apparent. And is another special relativistic effect that can arise when you have a relativistic jet. It has to be relativistic pointed nearly along the line of sight. And again, if you work out all the special relativistic effects, it mainly deals with the, the, the jet 
plasma nearly keeping up with the radiation it is emitting, um, you can get that sort of apparent superluminal motion, provided the jet is indeed relativistic. So um, those basic observations provide overwhelming evidence that these jets are relativistic uh, and are often moving at 90% plus the speed of light. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, um, all of all of this stuff um, implies that, that, that um, the observed properties of jets and of radio loud AGNs in general depend strongly upon orientation. So it, this makes it very challenging, for example, to gather sort of complete representative samples of radio loud active galactic nuclei because these, um, especially at high frequencies, because these relativistic beaming effects and so on change the flux compared to what it truly would be if the source were emitting isotropically. Now, if you go down to low radio frequencies where you're only observing the extended lobes, well, th there you can get much more complete and reliable samples. Okay, so... The jets are unquestionably relativistic. That's point number one. Point number two, I want to talk about how these systems are stable over a huge range of scales, implying a kind of gyroscope, keeping the axis of these systems stably pointed in the same direction for millions of years. Okay, so here are, um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of jets maintaining their pointing direction on a huge range of scales. Here is Cygnus A, our prototypical object that we started with. Uh, and here you can see it is the very large scale image, such that that bar is 35,000 light years. Here is zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, down to a two light year bar scale there. And note that the jet remains pointed in essentially the same direction over that huge range of physical scales. That implies there is some kind of a gyroscope keeping the pointing fixed in the same direction over an enormously large time scale. And, and that all manages to occur from a source originating down in the center of a galaxy, which we know from the previous lectures I presented is an enormously chaotic and complicated and crowded place. Nevertheless, something down there is remarkably stable and says, I want that jet to go in that direction and only that direction for tens of millions of years. Okay, so that's, that's remarkable. I mean, a gyroscope is needed to keep the thing pointed in a direction for a long period of time. And then, um, well, as you can see here, and as I'll show you in more detail soon, you can indeed trace the jet down to the vicinity of the supermassive black hole down to very small physical scales. Here are a couple of uh, other examples. Here is a very famous system, well studied for, for many years, NGC 6251. Again, here is the jet zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and again, you can see it remains pointed in the same direction for a very long period of time. Um, here is M87, a, a different set of images of M87. And um, again, here you can see uh, on a large scale, such as that bar is 3000 light years, uh, zooming in down to three light years, zooming in to 0.3 light years, and then in this case, showing results from the Event Horizon Telescope, which has now imaged the shadow of the black hole in silhouette against the, the background plasma on a scale of now 0.003 light years. And um, <coughs> people have managed to track the jet of M87 down to impressively small size scales. Uh, indeed, uh, this is recent work from 2018 where the limbed Brighton jet of M87 has been tracked all the way down to the seven Swartz shield radius scale. And this is the sort of key image uh, from that paper where, uh, again, this now is a fantastically high resolution um, radio image derived, of course, by combining radio uh, telescopes all around the Earth with the interferometry technique. And um, that bar, again, is 0 0.2 milliarc seconds, and that corresponds to 0 0.016 parsecs or corresponds to 28 Schwarzschild radii for the black hole in, in M87. We know that the black hole in M87 is a very massive one, has a mass of about 6 billion times the mass of the sun, and that bar length corresponds to just 28 times the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of that mass. And you can see the jet is present down to these very small scales. They detect a jet being present all the way down to seven Schwarzschild radii. So, 
you know, it's unquestionable that these jets form in the immediate vicinity of the black hole, or at least some of them do, because we, we see it directly in imaging now, which is a remarkable technological achievement that that, that can be done. But it, it unquestionably is true. I mean, there, there, are the, there are the results. You can read this paper for all the evidence, and it's quite, quite compelling. So we see jets down to very small physical scales. Now then, there's a lot of interesting physical processes that play out as a jet goes from you know this scale to this scale to this scale to this scale and so on. And I want to say a few words uh, about that now. Um, so here is a, a nice uh, a little um, diagram here that shows the characteristic order of magnitude steps going out in Schwarzschild radii and going out in parsecs um, as one moves along the jet axis. And for sort of comparison, I've put images of M87 over here from the very smallest scale, like the one I just showed you, down reaching again down to seven square shield radii, out to larger and larger and larger and larger scales. And there's a number of key phenomena that occur as jets propagate outward. First of all, jets have to launch. We'll talk a little bit about jet launching near, near the end of this lecture, but you know the idea there is that jets likely uh, are launched via the effects of a fairly strong magnetic field. And um, the jet, well, you can see here, the jet actually launches with a fairly large opening angle. This, this angle from here over to there, that's a fairly large opening angle of the jet that is observed on, on small scales. And likely, and apparently, the motion on these scales is, is fairly slow. And then, as the jet propagates out to sort of a parsec or so, so that would correspond to this three light your image here you can see for, for M87. Well, then the jet accelerates and further collimates. Uh, the idea there for, for the acceleration is the magnetic energy um, converts into kinetic energy, thereby increasing the bulk speed of the jet. And um, the opening angle um, of the jet decreases. You can see the opening angle is fairly wide here, but when you go out to these larger scales, the opening angle becomes narrower. So the jet collimates uh, as well. Um, then, as you go out to now substantially larger scales, out to 100 parsecs, 1,000 parsecs, um, sort of kiloparsec scales, well, the, now you have sort of a, a near equipartition jet where the particles and the magnetic fields in the jet are roughly sharing their energy. Uh, now shocks can develop in the jet. Plasma instabilities can start to occur. And um, then when you go out to the very largest scales, out to 100 kiloparsecs or, or more, here, here again, this is the tw this is a 200,000 light year scale image uh, of M87. Well, now you're out in the dissipation region where the jet disrupts, forms the radial lobes that we've talked about, and now the kinetic energy converts into radiation which you see is the beautiful lobes out on the large scale. So those are the various sort of things that occur during the life of a jet. It launches, uh, it, it accelerates and collimates. It, it has a, a good long run as a kinetic flux dominated jet. And, and then it ultimately dissipates out on the very largest scales. So that's a number of important physical processes that happen along the scale of a jet. Okay, um, now I wanna say just a few words about precession. Um, so we know that some jets uh, process. Um, the, the, the sort of most unquestionable example is a famous uh, galactic stellar mass black hole system, um, SS433. This is a, a binary system in our galaxy containing a compact object, likely a black hole, um, that is known to uh, process. And um, here... In, in the bottom here, in fact, you can see uh, radio imaging showing this beautiful corkscrew morphology of the jets. You see that there, how the jets have a, are not straighted linear, but look like a corkscrew on the sky. So, so what's going on there? Well, the standard interpretation of this phenomenon, which has been known for many years, um, is that um, the jets of the, the core of this system is processing somehow. Um, the details of exactly how that works are, are, are very complex and are still somewhat debated. 
There's still papers coming out upon that to the to this very day. But um, the, the point is there's a procession of the core down there. The same way that a child's top, once you started spinning and let it run down a little bit, starts to process. Something in this system was leading to procession as well. Um, and then, well, at any, and then the system is continually emitting jets. Now, any given blob of plasma emitted by the jet, once, it, once it's been emitted, of course, travels out in a straight line. But as the core wobbles around in the sky, that leads to this corkscrew behavior. The same way that, you know, a lawn sprinkler that twirls around leads to these twirled apparent patterns of water. Um, it's the same idea here for, for SS-433. Okay, um, and I, I will just mention in passing, in fact, that this, that this um, jet extends out to large scales and in fact interacts with the, the supernova remnant that SS-433 lives within and produces large scale structures out here and out here, um, which are you know, somewhat analogous to the lobes of uh, the radio galaxy. So this is a, a micro quasar system that has many of the same phenomenon uh, as the uh, supermassive uh, black hole systems. But, but this system has the advantage, being much smaller, that the processes happening in the system play out on short time scales. I mean, you can actually see the procession over time because it's only, the procession period is only 162 days. <clears throat> and people over time can see the jet of, of SS-433 changing substantially. So, um, you know, this system has the advantage of time scale. Whereas if you go out to the supermassive black hole system, the time scales are million times or more longer. And, and there things are harder because you can't sort of pull things apart using the time axis. So, um, but nevertheless, people have looked at radio images of some of these systems and think they may see evidence for precession of a core. Here is an example of a radio image of a 3C449. And here is a model that has been derived attempting to explain the, the observed map with the precession of a jet. Okay, and here is a comparison of the data and the model, and it seems to work pretty well. Now, again, I would say this isn't overwhelming, but you can see there is qualitative similarity to, to SS-433. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean this has to be precession, but it's, you know, perhaps suggestive. Um, here, here are a couple of other examples. Here is a system that is quite bent, uh, and a jet precession model can fit this one pretty well as well. Um, here are a number of additional um, systems with complex radio morphology. Here's an X-shaped radio morphology system that can be explained with a jet precession model. Here are a few other systems that, again, can be possibly explained by a jet precession model. So it may be that like a, a child's top, uh, you know, and like SS-433, uh, there can be a sort of a core, a gyroscope, as I referred to, that, again, processes around if it is perturbed in some way, for example. And maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe that's what's going on in some of these systems. I'd say the evidence, this sort of argument is, is still ongoing there. Um, and if you want to see some more information, and perhaps if you want to see a more skeptical take on the possibility of this jet procession, uh, you can read uh, section 7.4 of the book by Andrew King, just recently has come out, that Tay has a rather skeptical take on this possibility. In my personal feeling, um, you know, I think that the, the I think we still need to gather more data, and, and uh, you know, I, I think I think the um, the jury is still out on this one as to whether there was precession of the core sometimes for these supermassive black hole systems or not. Okay, now um, I will end this uh, section by talking about the possibility that there may have been jet activity or something much like it in our own galaxy in in the distant past. Um, so I'm sure you know that there have been these Fermi bubbles uh, discovered uh, in our galaxy. Fermi was a high energy gamma ray uh, uh, satellite and, that, that, well, and is a high energy gamma ray satellite that has surveyed the sky extensively. And um, if you take the large scale gamma ray image of the sky, if you remove all the point sources of gamma rays, and cut out the galactic plane emission, you then see bright gamma ray emission sticking way up above and way down below the plane of our galaxy on very large scales, on scales of like nine kiloparsecs or so. Um, 
Furthermore, um, more recently, uh, X-ray observations with the E. Rosita satellite have now uh, detected large-scale X-ray bubbles in the halo of the Milky Way that surround the Fermi bubble. So here, the Fermi emission, I believe, is in is in the red. Yeah, is in the red, and the the, the cyan color shows the X-ray bubbles surrounding the gamma ray bubbles as detected with the Rosita. And here's a nice uh, schematic that shows the Fermi bubbles as the sort of light purple color, and then the E. Rosita bubbles as these large um, scale uh, structures, even larger, wh whereas the Fermi bubbles extend out to like nine kiloparsecs or so. Uh, the E. Rosita bubbles extend all the way up and above and below the plane out to like 14 kiloparsecs. So these are enormous structures. You know, and for comparison, you know, that is our solar system on the scale of the galaxy. So these things, these are enormous structures associated with our galaxy. And the question naturally arises, well, where did these come from? Could these be uh, from an AGN jet feedback process? Uh, or could, it, could they be from a supernova-driven outflow? Well, we don't know for sure. I think the jury is still out here again. But there is at least a possibility that... This, some of these structures were formed by jets associated coming from the supermassive black hole of our galaxy when our galaxy was activated at some time in the distant past. Um, I'll also mention that in the radio, people have detected large-scale radio bubbles as well. Here is a, a paper reporting uh, the inflation of 430 parsec bipolar radio bubbles. Uh, in the galactic center region by an energetic event. So these are much small. And, and here, well, here you can see the nice radio image uh, gathered with the Meerkat uh, telescope. And you can see these large scale radio, excuse me, radio structures here and here going above and below the plane of our galaxy running along there. And here's a schematic labeling various structures there. Um, again, now the point here is that these radio structures that are seen are much smaller and are much less energetic than the Fermi bubbles and the E. Rosita bubbles. These structures are much larger, again, going out to 14 kiloparsecs as opposed to here, 430 parsecs. But nevertheless, these are impressively large structures. And, you know, it, is, had been, it has been suggested that, that these um, radio bubbles may be one of a series of intermittent events that cumulatively over time have acted to make the Fermi and E. Rosita bubbles. And we're still trying to understand those structures, but it's interesting to think that there may have been sort of jet-related activity even in our own galaxy uh, long ago. So in this uh, next session, we are now going to talk about the uh, definition of uh, radio-loud active galactic nuclei a little more uh, precisely. And then we will talk about the unified model for radio loud active galactic nuclei. Um, first of all, in terms of uh, defining uh, radio loud active galactic nuclei, well, luminous type one uh, active galactic nuclei are often divided into radio loud versus radio quiet systems. Um, this is often done with a parameter called the radio loudness parameter, which is the ratio which is called r and is is the ratio of the luminosity of the system or the flux of the system at 5 gigahertz over the luminosity or flux of the system at 4400 angstroms sometimes a somewhat different optical wavelength is used but it basically is a ratio of radio luminosity or radio flux to optical luminosity or optical flux um and here well, values of R in the range between about 10 to 100 are typical, and although admittedly somewhat arbitrary, as I will explain, uh, separator values, where sources above that threshold are called radio loud, sources below that threshold are called radio quiet. And according to that kind of a definition, I believe when you use R of, of 10, about 10% 10 of luminous type 1 active galactic nuclei are found to be radio loud. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, however, if you look at the distribution of this R parameter um, among the overall luminous type 1 AGM population, well, there is no strong bimodality that would really support there being two distinct groups of radio quiet and then a totally distinct group of radio loud. 
Uh, in fact, here is uh, one of those uh, distributions from some fairly recent work, which basically shows, again, sort of the, the number density or the probability function as a function of radial loudness parameter, which, again, is the ratio of the radial luminosity to the optical luminosity. And um, <clears throat> you can see for sources that in that magnitude range and at a range of different redshifts with the different shading that um, there is this distribution and well, at many redshifts, you doesn't seem to be much of any, but any hint of a bimodality at all. The distribution clearly declines as you go to high radio loudness values, corresponding to extremely radio loud radio loud AGNs being rare. But um, only, for example, in this light gray shaded case, is there much of a hint of a bimodality. And even that, I would say, is only really suggestive, given the various complexities and possible biases involved. But um, in any case. That's what the distribution looks like. The distribution is such that, as expected, there are many more radio quiet systems than radio loud systems. And when you add things up and integrate above, un, under this curve, above, say, a, 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 a log R or R value of, of um, 1, then, um, well, you basically have uh, about 10% of luminous AGNs being radio loud. Um, now, the fact that there's no, no strong bimodality that, again, as I've already alluded to, makes this a bit of an arbitrary game. And, you know, what you call radio loud and what you call radio quiet is somewhat semantic. And, you know, this distribution certainly doesn't give any real indication that there's some fundamentally totally different physical process, you know, as you, you know, th that somehow the systems transition leading to a bimodal distribution at some value of the radio loudness parameter. The smoothness of this overall distribution basically suggests that, well, um, these systems, you know, all have a basic underlying similarity to them. And as you dial up some sort of a radio loudness, some, some sort of a physical knob in the system, the radio loudness parameter rises in a continuous way. This is a continuum rather than two distinct groups. That's what I'm trying to say, I suppose. Um, now, this is one example of a definition. This works pretty well for luminous type 1 AGNs, but it's going to fail for other types of systems. Uh, for example, this will fail for type 2 objects uh, that we talked about in the, um, the previous lecture on the torus and the unified model. Type 2 objects where uh, the system is obscured by a torus or some equatorial material lying along the line of sight, well, that will prevent you from seeing the bright, certainly the bright optical emission on, formed on small scales close to the supermassive black hole. So this, this, this quantity will no longer represent like the disk luminosity of the system as it does for the type 1 objects, but rather it represents probably host light which, and, and that means the, makes the whole definition not mean the same thing as it did for the luminous type 1 AGNs. So it's going to fail for type 2 AGNs, and it's also going to fail for uh, low luminosity AGNs, where the host galaxy dominates even if they're not obscured, because then again, the light at this wavelength may be dominated by the host galaxy, and thus this ratio doesn't physically mean, mean the same thing as it does for the luminous type 1 AGNs. So in systems like that, the definition gets even harder to make, uh, and other methods are often used. Uh, for example, people often look at the ratio of the radio luminosity to the luminosity at 24 microns. That turns out to be practically useful and tends to work better for systems that can be obscured. That's the so-called Q24 uh, value. Or sometimes people just use a radio luminosity threshold and say systems above a certain radio luminosity, we're going to call those to be radio loud. So there's a variety of definitions uh, in, in these more complex regimes. And you have to be careful in those regimes about how you define things. And I refer you to the literature for extensive discussion on those types of definitions, which have been thought through quite thoroughly. Um, okay, now, now I want to say some words about the uh, unification of radio loud active galactic nuclei. Um, I have a few initial points. First of all, uh, radio loud AGN unification is much more complex than radio quiet AGN unification. And there is still debate over various aspects. And in fact, here is a, a modified version of that diagram that I've uh, previously shown. Uh, and remember, th this diagram um, shows 
radio quiet AGNs in the bottom half and radio loud AGNs in the top half. And you can see the radio quiet AGNs, well, the unification idea there is fairly simple, okay? Uh, you either are uh, looking uh, uh, from a sort of tight two or safer two orientation such that your line of sight you know, intersects uh, equatorial obscuring material. Or alternatively, you look at a larger, uh, you look at a less, in, you look at the system in a less inclined manner, and then you can look down into the central regions and see the um, central emission, see the emission from the uh, broadline region, and so on. So that's fairly simple for the radio quiet AGNs. Now look at the radio loud AGNs up here on top. Instead of having just these two things, you have one, two, three, four, five, six things. And things break down into whether you have radiatively efficient accretion over on the right-hand side or radiatively inefficient accretion over on the left-hand side. And then you have these things called lurgs or these other things called hergs, and each one of them breaks down into subgroups. And then you have the blazars, which are systems where the jet is inclined nearly along your line of sight and causes additional effects. And so the point is the unification idea as you can just see from basic inspection of this diagram, gets a whole lot more complex for the radio loud AGNs. Okay, and so then again, as I mentioned, as a result, there is still some debate over the various aspects. So what I will aim to do here to keep this manageable is uh, I will aim to present the key points, leaving aside some smaller technical exceptions. Um, <clears throat> and I am generally going to be following uh, section 6.1 of the recent review by Hardcastle and Croston in 2020, and I refer you to that paper in that particular section for, for some more details. Um, now, before I can even start talking about all these unification ideas properly, I'm going to have to spend about 10 slides covering a few new ideas that I have not yet introduced, and so I'm going to do that, and then we'll come back and talk about this diagram more. Okay, so, so let's start <coughs> with um, these hergs and lurgs that, that are labeled here and here. What's going on with that? Well, <coughs> people have obtained high quality optical spectra of many radio galaxies, and these show a range of behavior. To start with, just broadly speaking, they break down into two overall classes. There are the so-called high excitation radio galaxies or hergs, and there are the low excitation radio galaxies, or LURGs. Um, now, unfortunately, despite what you will sometimes read in the literature, there is not a simple sort of one-to-one -one mapping between the HERGs and the FR2 uh, morphologically classified radio galaxies. And similarly, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the, the LURGs and the FR1 classifications despite what is sometimes written in the literature. I mean, people who say that do have some motivation because there does seem to be a tendency for the you know, FR2 systems you know, often to be the HERGs and the FR1s often to be the LURGs. Uh, you can read again about the details in this paper if you want to read about exactly how all the associations go. Um, th there is a general association with there, but there's plenty of exceptions as well. So there's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping between the famous fanaroff riley morphological classifications and the Hergs and the Lurgs, you know, unfortunately. Okay, now <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the Hergs, and then we'll talk about the Lurgs. So these, again, are the high excitation radio galaxies. These systems, when you take their spectra, and study their spectra, study their spectral energy distributions and so on, appear to have usual disk, corona, BLR, NLR, and torus components. All the good stuff that we've talked about in many of the previous lectures can just be imported into our discussion of HERGs. Um, to zero with order, uh, these systems look like a kind of normal radio quiet AGN, but with a jet added on top of it, okay? And what is the motivation for that? Well, I have a couple things to say. Um, first of all, you take spectra of these things and you see normal type AGN emission lines. Here's that optical spectrum of Cygnus A taken back in 1975. There's nice, strong, high ionization, narrow lines in this system. 
Here are a couple of uh, broadline region lines from different radio galaxies. Look how broad they are, okay? Here's another one, nice high ionization lines, okay? Now, ultimately then, how do you define a herd versus a lurk? Well, you go back to these uh, BPT classification diagrams that I talked about in some detail in the lecture on the narrow line region, where again here, like oxygen three divided by H beta serves as a good indicator of um, high ionization levels versus lower ionization levels. And then these different other ratios are useful for indicating other uh, relevant uh, phenomena, like whether there's a partially ionized zone in the line emitting region and so on, which tells you whether there's x-rays in the system or not. And again, you can go back and review the lecture on the narrow line region where, where some of that is presented. Um, in any case, the HERGs are these blue, in these diagnostic diagrams, the, the high excitation radio galaxies are the ones up here with high excitation, and the LURGs are down here. And if you remember back to the lecture on the narrow line region, typically this is where the sort of safer type AGNs lived, and this is where the liners lived, okay, the LURGs. So we're gonna, right now we're focusing on the sort of safer type systems, the HERGs. They, they lie in the same part of these diagnostic diagrams as the normal safer type AGNs and quasars did that we talked about previously in the lecture on the narrow line region. Okay, that's one point that, that sort of justifies the idea that these things are like a normal, healthy, red-blooded, radioquiet AGN, but with a jet added on top. Um, also, uh, you can look at the spectral energy distributions of these things. Here are the spectral energy distributions of a bunch of radio loud quasars compared to a bunch of radio quiet quasars here in the bottom panel. These ones in the upper panel being radio loud quasars would be examples of high excitation radio galaxies. Okay, and you can see um, that at least running from the infrared through to the optical through to the ultraviolet, the overall spectral energy distribution is rather similar for the radio loud quasars and the radio quiet quasars, indicating again that many of the same physical structures that we know and love from the radio quiet objects are also present at least in the high excitation radio galaxies. Now obviously in the radio these things are considerably stronger um, because they're radio loud obviously and there also are some interesting effects in the x-ray band that I'll briefly discuss a little bit later on but um, you know overall at least again from the infrared through to the ultraviolet the high excitation radio galaxies and the radio quiet AGNs have similar underlying SED properties when you can measure them well indicating that indeed you have a good healthy AGN down in there with a disc and a corona and a BLR and an NLR and a torus and so on. Okay, now then, these high excitation radio galaxies can be further broken down into um, broadline radio galaxies, BLRGs, and narrow line radio galaxies, NLRGs, and these resemble the radio quiet type 1 and type 2 Seyfert galaxies. Again, the broadline radio galaxies are ones like these ones down here that I'm pointing at that, that have these nice broad BLR lines. Though that's just like what you see for the type 1 radio quiet AGNs. And the narrow line radio galaxies, the ones where you only see the narrow line emission, are like the type 2 Seyfert galaxies, like Cygnus A over here. Okay. So they break down that way. And again, as I mentioned already, the, the high excitation radio galaxies also include the radio loud quasars within that group. Um, <clears throat> these systems, just like for the safer galaxies and the quasars that we've talked about previously, are thought to be high accretion rate systems where radiatively efficient accretion is ongoing. Uh, and thus, these are often referred to as radiative mode or quasar mode systems. Okay, those are often names that are used when discussing these types of systems. Okay, so those are the high excitation radio galaxies. Okay, that's the first point. The next point now is I have to talk about the low excitation radio galaxies, the LURGs. Um, for these systems, the line emission is low excitation, according to those BPT diagnostic diagrams, and is often weak. Uh, these systems do not have obvious direct counterparts among radio quiet type 1 and type 2 safer galaxies. Although they do have some similarities to radio quiet uh, liners. 
Um, if you look at these systems, look at optical spectra of these systems, well, here are three examples of low excitation radio galaxies. The lines are fairly weak and unimpressive. I mean, there's H alpha, there's H alpha, and so on. And um, <coughs> the in the diagnostic diagram, the lurgs dot lie down in the low excitation region of the diagram. Okay. Um, furthermore, um, the nuclear optical and x-ray emission, when people go and study, for example, spectral energy distributions of these lurgs, sometimes appears to come entirely from the jet. So these systems often appear to be jet-dominated systems. And then, moreover, uh, these systems, in contrast to the HERGs, which were the higher uh, accretion rate systems, the LURGs appear generally to be lower accretion rate systems where likely radiatively inefficient accretion is ongoing. Okay, so then here is a plot that's quite useful that compares uh, estimates, reasonable estimates, of the Eddington ratios of high excitation radio galaxies and low excitation radio galaxies. And if you look at the radiative power compared to the Eddington, expected Eddington limit for these systems, you see the high excitation systems have high Eddington ratios in general, higher Eddington ratios in general, whereas the low excitation systems have lower Eddington ratios in general. And the same thing here when you compare that ratio adding in um, mechanical power uh, as well associated with the jet, some estimate of that. These are not high precision measurements of Eddington ratios by any means, I would say, but they're something. And you know, in an order of magnitude sense, you can see the lurgs are generally well below the, the lurgs are generally well below the hergs in terms of Eddington ratio. So these are low accretion rate systems where a different type of accretion mode that we have not talked about such so far is ongoing, known as radiatively inefficient accretion. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about radiatively inefficient accretion because it will be relevant for understanding the LURGs and the overall unified model for radio loud AGNs. But, but furthermore, just as a point of terminology, um, these systems are often called jet mode or radio mode systems. Okay, so now let's talk about this radiatively inefficient accretion a little bit. Okay, so we're going to do a quick study, um, just a couple of slides, uh, on the enormous topic of radiatively inefficient accretion. So, so here is the basic idea. Uh, when a system is accreting at a low accretion rate, uh, the accretion flow uh, transitions into a radiatively inefficient mode. So how does that work? Well, I have some points here that's going to try to explain that. Well, at low accretion rates, the density of the accretion flow is, is lower. Uh, and thus, when the, uh, uh, when the uh, density becomes sufficiently low, particle collisions start to become rare. Um, thus, the ion temperature decouples from the electron temperature because ions and electrons are not frequently sufficiently uh, frequently scattering off of each other to share their energy effectively. And so their temperatures decouple. And I'll talk more about how those temperatures behave momentarily, but the ion temperature decouples from the electron temperature. Um, the electrons, of course, having low mass and being able to accelerate easily, thus radiate much of their lost gravitational potential energy as they work their way down closer to the black hole. And as they do that, as they radiate, they make a spectrum that differs strongly from that of a standard thin disk, as, as we will see. Um, on the other hand, the ions having large masses do not radiate efficiently, and thus the ion temperature rises to become much, much larger than the electron temperature, although both of these temperatures are very hot. For example, the ion temperature may rise up to be an extremely impressive, like 10 to the 12 Kelvin, uh, whereas the electron temperature may be down at about you know, a billion to 10 billion Kelvin. Very hot indeed for electrons, but, but not as hot as the ions. And so uh, you can see here again, the um, ion temperature has decoupled from the electron temperature because the density is low, so the particles aren't scattering off each other so much. Okay, and in this kind of a regime, the flow then will inflate to become geometrically thick and optically thin. Okay, so schematically, here is a nice diagram that compares the accretion modes 
uh, that systems can have, accreting black holes can have at low accretion rates over here, sort of medium accretion rates over here, and then very high accretion rates over here. This one over here on the right is not relevant to our discussion today, so I will not talk about it any further, but I want to talk about this one primarily. So for the, the LURGs, okay, you have a relatively inefficient accretion flow. As I've already mentioned, it becomes a two-temperature plasma where the ion temperature is far above the electron temperature, and the flow has puffed itself up to become geometrically thick, yet also optically thin. It's a very different mode of accretion than the standard you know, geometrically thin disk that we have talked about in general in connection with active galactic nuclei. This is a very different thing going on here. Um, in this kind of a regime, the ions present can invect their can invect their thermal energy, that is bulk transport their thermal energy inward. And there's a lot of thermal energy they have because they're really hot. Remember, they're up at like 10 to the 12 Kelvin. So they can invect that thermal energy inward moving closer toward the black hole until ultimately they pass through the black hole's event horizon and are gone. So they invect their thermal energy inward. That thermal energy passes through the black hole's event horizon and is gone, and thus the flow becomes radiatively inefficient. And, and this diagram down here is useful for kind of visualizing and sort of, sort of roughly understanding the, the nature of the effect. This shows the luminosity of the system compared to the Eddington luminosity compared to the mass accretion rate of the system compared to the Eddington mass accretion rate. And up in the regime of a thin disk where you have radiatively efficient accretion, well there at relatively high m dot values, the luminosity linearly depends upon m dot as you would expect. You have an efficiency times m dot times c squared and that's your luminosity. However, at lower values of m dot down here, the luminosity, as you can see, drops rapidly as m dot declines. In fact, it approximately follows the luminosity being proportional to m dot squared, okay, approximately. And, um, well, again, that is because the flow is becoming radiatively inefficient. So these systems with low m dots become very low luminosity. First of all, because the accretion rate is small, but then secondly, even more because the, um, the, the flow becomes inefficient. And so you don't get, just get whacked by having a low mass accretion rate. You also get whacked by having a low efficiency. So the luminosity systems becomes very low indeed, as you can see, down to like a millionth or less, okay, the Eddington luminosity. So <clears throat> that's how this radiatively efficient, inefficient accretion can play out. <clears throat> now, there are many associated complications to be sure. Um, outflows can occur, as you can see here, for these are expected to occur for these radiatively uh, inefficient accretion flows when you consider the detailed fluid mechanics of the, of the system. Um, furthermore, uh, convection uh, can set in and, and can affect the, the physical motions in the flow. Uh, magnetic fields likely have a large role to play in setting the, the flow, and people talk about magnetically arrested disks and standard and normal evolution of accretion. And you can see, for example, this review article for some discussion of these things. And um, in fact, that's even noted down in the caption of this figure where they say that this figure only has sort of one axis, the accretion rate axis here. And again, these, these low efficiency accretion flows set in below about a hundredth uh, of Eddington or so. Um, but the, the caption says, additionally, uh, there, there's a strong argument that this illustration have a second dimension with the extra, extra parameter being the net magnetic flux that threads the disk. That is indeed likely the case. And so magnetic fields likely have a large role to play in shaping these flows overall. But anyway, all that being said, we're now done with our overall sort of um, introductory slides. And now we can talk about radio loud unification. So... We're going to talk about the upper half of this diagram now. We've already covered the lower half well in the previous lectures. Um, so let's talk about the upper half. Well, <clears throat> things first of all break down as to whether you have radiatively efficient accretion, that is you have a sort of a radiative mode or a quasar mode corresponding to the high excitation radio galaxies. That's when you're over on this side. And alternatively, on this side of the diagram, you have a radiatively inefficient accretion uh, mode. Uh, you have a jet mode or a radio mode type accretion over on this side. 
First, let's talk about this side. This side, again, is sort of more immediately understandable given what we've talked about for the radio quiet systems. Here, you basically, again, have a good, uh, healthy, um, sort of red-blooded, rapidly accreting system. It behaves a lot like a radio quiet system, um, but you have a jet added on on top. So you could have systems viewed at a high inclination, and in that case, your line of sight will intersect the obscuring material, and you won't see down into the central regions. But then if you observe it at a, at a less inclined manner, you can see down into the um, central regions. And then if you go to even higher, excuse me, even, even lower inclination, um, you, you can then have a so-called blazar, where the jet emission coming out beams its the jet beams its radiation in your direction and you get strongly beamed radiation affecting what you see so that's what happens for for the high excitation radio galaxies and there have been many uh, very successful studies of the unification model for the high excitation radio galaxy systems the radiatively inefficient ones here are just two examples of of hundreds of such papers here is one where uh, astronomers looked at a 3C radio galaxy in X-rays, used the penetrating power of X-rays to look through obscuring material, and they saw evidence for an obscured X-ray luminous quasar inside, nicely in agreement with the kind of unification model over here. Um, here is a, a nice study of Cygnus A, quite recently, just from this year, um, trying to investigate the nature of the obscuring torus of Cygnus A and trying to determine its nature. Um, I won't go through all the details here, but I mean, the, the, the first few sentences here uh, sort of lay out very clearly that the prototypical powerful FR2 radio galaxy Cygnus A fits extremely well into the Quasar Radio Galaxy Unified Model. You see high polarization from scattering, just like we talked about in the lecture on the Unified Model, with an angle almost perpendicular to the radio jet, exactly like you'd expect from a scattering mirror. And you have polarized flux showing broad permitted lines. So you're, again, getting a periscopic view down into the hidden broad line region. And, and there's an older paper led by Patrick Ogle and collaborators that presented some of those evidence. Anyway, here's a recent study. And there's many other such studies for the high excitation radio galaxies. Um, the, and essentially, the unified model, like what we talked about for the radio quiet system, seems to work pretty well for the high excitation radio galaxies. Now then... If you go over to this side of the diagram, for the low excitation radio galaxies, well, there things are trickier. Because remember, over here, well, the usual disk and corona and BLR and NLR and Taurus may not be present. Okay, so in fact, you know, if, if, I, if I had enough time, I would go try to Photoshop this diagram even more. And again, I have modified this diagram from the original of Beckman and Schrader, uh, following the Hardcastle and Croston review as best I could. Um, but, uh, you know, if I had more time, I'd go Photoshop this out and try to put a radiatively inefficient accretion flow down there. But my my skills with Photoshop probably are not sufficient for that anyway. It would be a good thing for someone to do. Um, nevertheless, the point is that over here on the Lurg side, where you have a radiatively inefficient accretion flow, you got one of these things going on over there okay and in general again you often see jet dominated emission over all these angles for some of these lurgs as far as we can tell um and uh, again these are these are low excitation systems generally lower power systems where you have a radiatively inefficient accretion flow okay so that's how the kind of unified model plays out uh, the final thing I, I want to talk about regarding you know the basics of this unified model for radio allowed AGNs are some more about the blazars. Again, the idea of the blazars is you have a jet coming out and that jet is beaming its radiation in its direction of motion. So the jet emission is very strong and it can um, strongly contribute to or even completely dominate the spectrum that you see. And that term, the term for systems that are like that is the term blazar which was a, a term introduced by an after-dinner speaker, I believe, at a conference. Um, and, and, you know, it, it kind of is a nice name. It sort of uh, conjures up a visual picture of blazing radiation shining out towards you. I'll just say a few words about these blazars because they are quite fascinating and there are extensive studies of them. So blazars, <clears throat> again, are systems, as I've just said, where the jet is coming out and this sort of bright... Um, sort of starburst type emission here, I guess, is, is you know, indicator lens flare emission, you know, is uh, 
indicating the bright radiation from the jet. And um, these blazars being, you know, jet dominated or strongly jet contributed to systems have a number of relevant properties. First of all, as you would expect, they tend to have core dominant morphologies because the jet is pointed right at you. The system is inclined so that you're, you're pulled on. And then, as you would expect from our classification we discussed earlier, they have flat radio spectra. They also have um, spectral energy distributions dominated by jet emission at many wavelengths. Uh, and they're often strong uh, in gamma rays up to TeV energies. And here is a plot that kind of illustrates some spectral energy distributions, characteristic model spectral energy distributions for these blazars of different luminosities. This is a so-called example of a blazar sequence. Um, <clears throat> basically, down at low frequencies, you generally have synchrotron radiation from the jet electrons. And then at higher frequencies, you have inverse Compton scatter radiation. And that can come either from the jet electrons, I think for generally for lower luminosity systems. And then for higher luminosity systems, you often get a scattered emission from the torus, from the broadline region, and so on being inverse Compton scattered. In any case, the point is you have these very broadband, highly jet dominated spectra. And just to show you how impressive these spectra are, I mean, 2 keV is labeled there. And you can see the, 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 this is a log scale. So, so these systems go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine orders of magnitude, perhaps, eight or nine orders of magnitude up above 2 keV. So you go up through the MeV gamma rays and the GeV gamma rays up to the TeV gamma rays. So these are, these are very strong emitters sometimes up in very high energy gamma rays, which is quite impressive. Okay, so again, you have, jet, you have SEDs often dominated by the jet emission at many wavelengths. Um, also, uh, you often see highly variable emission uh, in these systems running from the radio through to the gamma rays. Here is just you know, one nice example of many, many such uh, variability events seen in the literature. Here is a system CTA-102, which is a flat spectrum radio quasar. And look at its R-band emission. It went from like 16 and a half magnitude up to like, like um, almost 11th, 11th magnitude. So it rose up to become much, much brighter than it was back here, again, due to motions in this case of the jet. In this case, they propose there is a twisted and inhomogeneous jet that can move back and forth and either beam radiation in your direction or not. And over here, you can see some of the remarkable variabilities of function of wavelength. These are spectral energy distributions at different times. And in the radio, it varies, not as dramatically, but look in the optical. This thing is varying like mad up and down. Okay, again, due to beaming effects along one of these jets. So there's lots of fascinating phenomena associated with these blazars. There's highly variable emission running from the radio through to the optical, through to the gamma rays. Um, also, these systems often have strong polarization, as you would expect um, from, from synchrotron, for example. Uh, they sometimes show apparent superluminal motion, as you would expect, because you have a relativistic jet that's going to be nearly pointed along your line of sight. The exact right geometry for superluminal motion, which is indeed often seen. Um, and then furthermore, these systems sometimes have weak emission lines due to jet dilution. Sometimes in the optical, um, the jet is so strong that it outshines uh, the, the line emission, for example, from the broad line region and makes the lines very weak or sometimes even essentially invisible. Here's a nice uh, composite of a set. This is the mean spectrum from combining 23 of these so-called Blazar BL LAC objects. And the beamed optical UV continuum, you can see, is nearly diluting the emission lines almost to invisibility. And the prototypical object, BL Lasserte, was long, in fact, mistaken as a star partly because of, of, of that uh, difficulty of the emission lines being diluted away. So, uh, we have now talked about the essentials of the unified model for radio loud AGNs, and I now just want to present uh, a few challenges uh, for this radio loud AGN unified model. Uh, we, I think the community knows this model is not fully perfect yet and further work is needed, and I'm going to present a few apparent observational challenges for it. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus on the high excitation radio galaxies, which um, again are thought to include the well, do include the radio loud quasars, which is where most of my discussion will be. 
And um, <clears throat> as we already talked about, for the high excitation radio galaxies, they appear to have a usual disk, corona, broadline region, narrow line region, torus, and so on, at least a first order. Um, <clears throat> and well then to zeroth order, um, they appear to be like a radio quiet AGN with a jet added on top. Okay, so let's see how well that basic idea, take a radio quiet AGN, just add a jet on top and see if you get a, a high excitation radio galaxy or a radio loud quasar. Um, so here is <coughs> one challenge that, that becomes apparent that, that's been known for a long time since the early 1990s. And um, that is, uh, if you go back and consider this eigenvector one quantity, which I introduced and discussed in considerable detail in the lecture on the broadline region, well, um, again, that eigenvector indicates that uh, quasars, quasar properties, for example, the emission line properties from the broadline region, like the strength of the iron two and the width of the H beta line and the H beta asymmetry, correlate with each other and also linked up in that correlation are properties of the narrow line region like the luminosity of O3 and also uh, properties from the black hole region like the slope of the x-ray emission, the apparent x-ray band emission, the strength of the soft x-ray excess is what that indicates. Um, <clears throat> in any case, the point here that I that is apparent that I did not really emphasize previously is that um, radio loud AGNs are shown in this diagram and, and they're shown such that the core dominated radio loud quasars are the open triangles and the uh, lobe dominated radio loud quasars are the open circles. And you notice that along this eigenvector one, the radio loud quasar AGNs preferentially lie over at one end of eigenvector one. Okay, they tend to have weak iron 2, they tend to have strong uh, optical O3 emission, they tend to have a broad H beta full with half maximum, and they tend to have um, <clears throat> H beta asymmetry in the red direction. And again, that's true for both the co core dominated and the lobe dominated systems. Okay, um, so that's a bit puzzling because again, if the unified model um, were strictly true. That is, you know, if a um, if a radio loud quasar is essentially just a normal radio quiet quasar with a jet added on top, well, then you wouldn't expect that. You wouldn't expect that um, the emission line properties would systematically differ for the um, radio loud systems compared to the radio quiet systems, but they clearly do. Okay. Um, and many other authors have noticed this same basic idea. Here is some other uh, nice work um, by Richards et al. Here, um, focusing in this case upon the carbon-4 emission line properties of radio loud quasars versus radio quiet quasars. And if you look at the carbon-4 emission line properties, well, the carbon-4 properties of radio loud quasars shown in the with the red contours clearly differ from the uh, emission line carbon-4 properties of the radio quiet quasars shown as the black contours. Specifically, the radio loud quasars have less blue shifted and somewhat stronger carbon-4 emission okay, than do the radio quiet quasars. So they're clearly different there as they are also different in these other properties, the iron-2 strength, the O3 luminosity, the full with half maximum of H beta, the H beta asymmetry, and so on. Okay, these things are different. So if that's, you know, it, that, that is true, but that is not what is expected under simple unification, where again, a radio loud quasar would just be a radio quiet quasar plus a jet. Something else is going on, you know, beyond the sort of zero with order, indicating that something about the unification is not strictly true. Okay, um, there, there are other challenges as well. I think I have two more, uh, which I will go through quickly. Another one is involves the observed corona jet connection for radio loud quasars. Uh, it, has now, it now seems pretty clear based upon recent work that luminous radio loud quasars, excluding the blazars, where again, you have this beam component as I talked about, but luminous radio loud quasars um, show dominant coronal X-ray emission and also X-ray reflection features, just like you would expect for radio quiet AGNs. Um, so the point being that we believe that the 
uh, x-ray emission from most typical radio loud quasars is coronal in nature, just like for the radio quiet AGNs, which is good. That, that's what you would expect according to the unified model. <clears throat> this is what you don't expect, however, is that notably, if you look at the radio loud AGNs and you look at the behavior of their coronal x-ray emission, it appears to become x-ray brighter with increasing jet power indicating, again, a corona jet connection. And that's what's shown in this diagram. For a radio quiet system, you have a radio quiet level strength x-ray emitting corona. But then as you go to moderately radio loud systems where the jet is presumably more powerful, the corona also becomes more powerful. Then if you go to highly radio loud systems where the jet is even more powerful, the corona becomes even more powerful still. Okay, there is a corona jet connection. Um, now this, again, is a challenge because a corona jet connection, which the data quite clearly indicate is present, as you can read about in these papers, um, is not expected under simple unification because under simple unification, again, you just take a normal radio quiet quasar, one of these, you stick a jet on top, and there you go. Um, that's your system. But that's not, that's not what is seen. What we see is that the nature of the corona departs from what you have for a radio quiet system as you dial up the jet because the corona becomes increasingly more luminous. So again, that's another example of a phenomenon that is not well explained by simple unification. Here's a third example. It has long been known, and I talked about this already in the lecture on winds, that um, if you look at winds, quasar winds, the ones that produce a particularly broad absorption lines, the strong broad absorption features we often see in the rest frame ultraviolet, well, the, the, the fraction of quasars showing these broad absorption line features depends upon radio power. And you can see that here. Here is the fraction of quasars showing, showing BALS, okay, versus radio luminosity. And this is shown both for bona fide broad absorption line features as well as for somewhat weaker ultraviolet absorption features. As you go up to very large radio luminosities, which presumably has something significant to do with, with the strength of the jet, the fraction of objects showing broad absorption lines clearly declines. Okay, you can see that here. So the point here, as, as written then, is that, of course, broad absorption lines generally avoid highly radioluminous quasars, although not entirely. There's a clear effect there. This is another phenomenon that is probably not expected under simple unification. Um, the reason for this phenomenon, again, is not entirely clear. Uh, one possibility is a quasar may be able to produce a strong, uh, wide-angle, um, sub-relativistic wind, or it may be able to produce a collimated, highly relativistic jet, but not both, at least usually not both. Um, that's a possible explanation for this type of behavior. And again, that's something you would not expect according to simple unification, where you just have a normal radio quiet quasar with a jet and they, each component goes about its business separately. Um, another possibility is this could might be able to be explained by orientation effects. And if that's the case, then maybe you could rescue the unified model by invoking an or complex orientation effects. That's why I sort of cautiously use the word prob probably here. But this is another challenge for the radio loud quasar unification model. And there are plenty others as well on the LURG side, which I haven't even talked about, for example. And um, the, the bottom line is that there is still much to learn about radio loud AGN unification. Okay, uh, then to uh, finish today, since this has been a long lecture, um, I want to say a few words about jet launching. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about some observational constraints upon jet launching. Um, there's a big question, which I'm sure has occurred to you as you've been listening to this lecture, and that is, well, how are these jets launched? Very good question. Thankfully, fully answering this question is beyond, you know, my responsibility, beyond the remit of, of this course, because this course is, again, focused on observations. It's an observational overview of active galactic nuclei. So thus, my coverage here will be brief and will be focused on some selected observational constraints upon jet launching that I think are important and relevant. Um, <clears throat> there are additional observational constraints that I simply cannot cover here due to limited time. And I also, of course, want to mention, and I'll show a slide about this at the end, there's also much excellent theoretical and numerical work on this topic that I will not even attempt to cover properly, but I will give you some references where you can learn more. Okay, so here again is that 
plot showing physical processes versus scale. And down in the launching region, close to the black hole, uh, well, it is thought that a strong magnetic field is involved in launching the jet. And the jet, again, launches with a fairly large opening angle in a way that is limb darkened. That already gives you some important clues about jet launching right there. Um, so an accreting, spinning, supermassive black hole model has promising and observationally supported ingredients for making jets. Um, you have a relativistically deep potential well associated with the supermassive black hole. That was clearly demonstrated, for example, in our lecture on the black hole region. You also have a preferred axis, the spin axis of the black hole, uh, that is stable. That can give you the necessary gyroscope uh, that, again, would be required to maintain a jet being pointed in the same direction on scales ranging from seven source shield radii all the way out to 3,000 light years and beyond. Okay, you have a preferred axis that is stable, naturally expected if you have a spinning supermassive black hole. That is the gyroscope. Um, you also have a large energy reservoir in a spinning black hole. Uh, there are some, some indications, for example, from X-ray measurements of the black hole region, as I talked about in that lecture, that we have evidence that black holes are indeed often spinning. And so um, that provides a natural large energy reservoir that could be tapped to produce a, a jet. And possibly, and certainly, if a black hole is a sufficiently massive and sufficiently rapidly spinning, has enough energy even to explain the, the phenomenal energy we see out in the lobes of um, these uh, radio loud active galaxies. Uh, furthermore, um, we have evidence, quite convincing now, for magnetic fields being present um, in the orbiting plasma down around the down in the accretion disk close to the supermassive black hole. Uh, for example, that those magnetic fields are thought to be associated with the formation of the corona that makes much of the X-ray emission. And we also, of course, have uh, indications, well, compelling indications of magnetic fields in the jet plasma itself, because you see, see it from the synchrotron, which requires magnetic fields. Um, so generally then, models invoke magnetohydrodynamical processes to divert some of the outflowing plasma outward and then keep it collimated. So you have these ingredients and you put these ingredients together um, in some way which remains poorly understood and magnetohydrodynamics uh, comes and um, here are the, the witches of Macbeth. And you know they say their incantation, how, how does it go? Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, right? And uprises the jet. Okay, there's the jet. So there you go. You have your ingredients, you put them in the MHD pot, and uprises your jet. Okay, so then, well, the natural questions uh, then occur. Well, well, then what sets if a strong jet will be launched? I mean, you have these ingredients, um, and, you know, which things actually matter for whether a jet will be launched? Is it the supermassive black hole spin? Is that alone the only thing that is required? Um, uh, or uh, do you have to have a magnetic, a magnetic field of sufficient strength or a magnetic field with an appropriate geometry or topology that allows the jet to be formed? Or do you need an environment that is conducive to the formation of a jet? Those are the types of factors one has to consider. We do have some interesting and useful observational constraints there. Uh, one, I would argue, goes back to this corona jet connection for radio loud quasars that I had mentioned, where again, we observe the corona becoming X-ray brighter with increasing jet power, indicating there is a corona jet connection present. These same observations um, indicate that black hole spin cannot be the sole factor leading to the launching of radio loud quasar jets. It certainly is a factor, but it can't be the only one. And the evidence for that is, is technically complex. It involves investigating a significant sample of these radio loud quasars and comparing their X-ray versus their optical versus their uh, radial properties. And if you want to read the arguments, um, I refer you to section 4.3 of this paper. Um, but it's pretty, pretty compelling that black hole spin alone cannot be the sole factor. There's good observational evidence for that, in my opinion. Um, 
So another factor needs needs you know, is observationally required, likely a suitable magnetic flux and or topology, and that has a lot to do with perhaps with this corona jet connection, you know, in the sense that perhaps the observed corona jet connection is reflecting changes in magnetic field and topology that both brighten the corona, which is a magnetic structure, and also promote magnetic jet launching. Those two things seem to be, you know, connected. And the idea is down here, uh, the magnetic field would only be suitable for a radio quiet system. You wouldn't launch a jet and the corona would not be extremely strong. Then as you, as the magnetic field change, that promotes a stronger corona and also promotes a jet. And then as you dial it up still further, the changes in the magnetic field structure allow a powerful jet and a very powerful corona. That's the suggestion coming from the observations that I'm aware of. Okay, um, there are other points I want to make as well briefly. Another point um, is that it seems quite compelling to me that luminous quasars with radiatively efficient accretion can launch jets. Now, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because um, some of my theoretical colleagues who I talk to, uh, you know, sometimes come up to me and have apparently decided, based upon their computer computations and so on, that um, only the radiatively inefficient systems uh, can make jets well. In fact, there's a prominent review article. I won't name it here, but you can email me if you want to know. There's a prominent review article that says as much. Um, and I just simply can't see how that agrees with observational reality uh, in, in the following way. I mean, here I, I will just present the example of 3C273, you know, the first quasar. This is a luminous quasar. It's one of the most luminous PG quasars. It has a B-band luminosity of minus 27. Here it is. You can see it is very bright. The quasar is outshining the galaxy in which it lives completely. Uh, there is the optical jet. Okay, so you've got a highly luminous quasar with a jet. The quasar has a standard blue quasar continuum. It has a normal spectral energy distribution as best we can measure it. And it has healthy quasar emission lines indicating that the, the big blue bump and so on is there in its normal way. So this is a quasar that certainly seems to be radiatively efficient. It's, it's luminous. It has a normal SED, it has strong emission lines, has a blue continuum, all the things you would expect for radiatively inefficient accretion, yet it undoubtedly is launching a jet. There it is, and there it is in the radio. Okay, so it seems pretty clear to me that luminous quasars with radiatively efficient accretion can launch jets. Now, some of my theoretical colleagues have tried to wiggle out of this fact by saying things like, well, maybe it's the case that 3C273 was radiatively inefficient long ago when its jet was made. And maybe right now the jet that's there is just a relic that is no longer being energized anymore, uh, but instead is just kind of left over from the past when 3C273 was previously in a radiatively inefficient mode. I don't think that's very likely either. Uh, and one good reason argument there is if you look at the, the jet on small scales, I mean, here is a paper going way back to 1985 on VLBI monitoring, measuring superluminal motions in the jet of 3C273. And here are some nice images showing the blobs in 3C273 on small size scales moving superluminally. Okay, that makes it quite unlikely, in my opinion, that the jet is somehow a relic. Uh, the jet is currently being, I mean, in recent years, in astronomical terms, in recent years, and these are seen up even up until the present day, you know, the, the, the jet is producing superluminal blobs on small scales, indicating the jet is being energized right now. And so you can't say that 3C273, um, you know, was radiatively inefficient when his jet was made long ago. And somehow the jet is no longer being made right now when it's radiatively efficient because it is being made right now. You can see it. So anyway, that's just, I think, an important point that I hope some theoretical and computational people will bear in mind when necessary. Um, and then uh, furthermore, um, I just want to mention a couple of other interesting things. Um, another fascinating topic, which I will not have time to cover properly today, is in fact... Uh, physicists and astronomers are now actually uh, attempting to do jet launching experiments in the lab. Uh, these uh, often in, often involve you know plasma physics experiments 
or cases where they sh uh, utilize a ring of laser beams to produce a mega gauss plasma jet uh, and, and, and so on. And so here are just four abstracts that you can use if you want to learn more about this. It's quite fascinating that now you can actually make some progress understanding these let with jets, with laboratory experiments. That's, that's very nice to see as an observer. And, and then finally, of course, I do want to mention that there are very productive simulations of jet formation that are being done by, by many researchers. Here's just one of them. This is a nice colorful image. It's, the color here shows the density uh, of plasma and the black lines are showing magnetic field lines in this case. Um, and um, I believe this is from work by, by this researcher, Tchaikovsky et al. And um, anyway, simulations of accretion flows now allow the jet power to be estimated as a function of supermassive black hole spin in some regimes and under some set of you know, reasonably well-motivated assumptions. And indeed, um, at high spins, uh, differences are found between um, what is computed and what is expected from the classical Blanford-Jnayek formula listed here, which I will not go into in detail, but you can read about it if you're interested. Um, much work on jet formation remains. And notably, you know, even for M87, where we now have radio imaging down to the event horizon, there uh, is substantial debate in papers coming out even over the past year or two on exactly how the jet is being launched. Some set of researchers say we think it's this, other sets of researchers think it's that. And, you know, they're all working toward getting to the truth. But it's remarkable. We're actually making real progress on understanding these jets and how they're being made on the very small scales. And if you'd like to learn more about the, the simulations of jet formation, I refer you to these two um, review articles and also this one here, which is challenging some of the orthodoxy recently on how the M87 jet is being made. And I will end there uh, for today, and thank you.